It seems that it's the uh, destiny of the Jewish people in every generation to fight a battle for historical truth. Because our adversaries use the same technique in every generation, and that is to twist the truth and to represent us, to represent everything we're doing in a false way. The main underlying theme that emerges over the last decade or more, maybe two decades, is what I call the effort to delegitimize the state of Israel. To remove the legal, historical basis for our country. And it comes in many different forms. I was Israel's ambassador to the United Nations. And this is one of the biggest challenges I faced. It, it, in fact, is not such a big challenge when you know the truth. But it's a challenge because so many people have been propagandized so many institutions have allowed themselves to be taken over by people who are willing to twist the truth. You know, the reason why it isn't so hard is because when you have a little familiarity with our history, you find something which actually my Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, said back in the 1990s, and I'm just going to quote him again. And that is, of all the states that are member states of the United Nations today, Israel is probably the most legitimate country in the world community. Because it is the only country that has a seat at the UN whose very legitimacy, whose very foundation was approved by the League of Nations, the body that preceded the UN, and by the United Nations, by both. It's many times forgotten in those older documents that were there at our foundation. The mandate docu document, for example, that spoke about the historical connection of the Jewish people to their land, to their homeland. That spoke about reconstituting a homeland for the Jewish people. You know, the mandate document is interesting to go back to if you wake up in the middle of the night and you want to read the internet and read something from your past. But the mandate document's interesting because it didn't create the rights of Israel and the rights of the Jewish people. It recognized a pre-existing right. Because back at the beginning of the 20th century, it was simply common wisdom that the Jews had been connected to Eretz Yisrael, and the Jews had a right to reestablish what was called their homeland in those early documents, but it was, if you read the writings of the Brits a few years later, they meant a Jewish state. And that's significant because part of the delegitimization, delegitimization effort is to say that Israel is a colonialist entity. It owes its birth to the colonial powers after World War I. But if they recognize the pre-existing right, a right that was there already, and they didn't give us that right, it's a right that we had, then this colonialist accusation is completely false and baseless. The return of Jews to their historic homeland is also something that didn't come on the wings of the colonial powers. Take Jerusalem. When I lecture around the world and I ask audiences, when do you think the Jews reestablished their majority in Jerusalem? Was it 1948? Usually half the audience says yes. Was it in 1967? The other half usually says 1967. It wasn't in 48 and it wasn't in 67. The Jews reestablished their majority in Jerusalem according to the diplomatic records of the great powers, particularly Britain, in the year 1863. 
The Ottoman Empire was still there. The British Empire had not reached the Eastern Mediterranean. And yet our people streamed back to their holy city. Cairo was an Arab city. Damascus was an Arab city. Baghdad was an Arab city in 1863. Although it had a large Jewish population. It was still, these were Arab cities. Jerusalem in 1863 had a clear Jewish majority. It was a Jewish city. People don't know that. They think we just are late arrivals to the uh, to our country, to our region. A friend of mine who worked at the Pentagon many years did a doctoral thesis based on reading the Ottoman archives. And he knew Ottoman Turkish. Remember, the old Ottoman Turkish had Arabic letters like Persian. And what did he discover in the Ottoman uh, archives? That in the 17th century, Tzfat, Safi, already had a Jewish majority. And the Ottomans had no interest in portraying the Jews as such a dominant force in the Galilee. So we've been there. And our claims are based on something old and something deep that once the main powers of the international community understood. How else is delegitimization tried? Well, we all remember in 1975, the so-called Zionism is racism resolution of the UN General Assembly. Another falsehood. You know, many um, European powers sent their people to Africa to try and help with development. But it were the Israelis who came to Africa who lived with the Africans. They weren't racists. But the racism charge was something which those who wanted to delegitimize the state of Israel tried to make. And of course, Chaim Herzog, our late ambassador and late president, tore up the resolution in the General Assembly, just expressing the deep disdain of the Jewish people towards the very accusation. We also had another way that delegitimization is tried and used against Israel. And that is to accuse the Israeli army, the IDF, of war crimes every time a war occurs in our region. The famous Goldstone Report falsely accused Israel of deliberately killing Palestinian civilians. That was when it was clear as day to anybody reporting on our wars in Gaza that Israel was one of the few countries in the world that actually gave warnings to people, warnings to their homes. Yes, we know you have Iranian missiles in your basement. You are a legitimate military target. You have seven minutes to leave your house. And then we would monitor with a UAV over the building to see that indeed people left the house. That's a moral army. That's a Jewish army. That is not an, an army that generates war crimes. But nonetheless, this is part of the challenges we as the state of Israel face. And it's much more than their tremendous concern with observing the laws of war. Those who make that charge are simply determined to take down the state of Israel, which is why we have to fight back, which is why we can't be silent, which is why we have to expose them. So the new subject of the, of the month I should say, of the last few years that everyone talks about is BDS, boycott, divestment, and sanctions. You know, many people who mistakenly and foolishly follow these movements believe that these movements are seeking to defend Palestinian rights. What they don't do is read what the founders of BDS have said and are saying. Their goal isn't the Palestinian state. Their goal is the elimination of Israel, which is why delegitimization of Israel is so important for them, even though the very thought of it is so alien and so wrong. They're not, they don't want the Palestinians to get a state. They want the Jewish state to be removed. 
Now, something else is happening today. While various movements are trying to attack us, while they're asserting, which are basically lies about our country, something has happened internationally that I want to share with you. It is commonly asserted by Israel's adversaries, and even by people in various Jewish communities who don't know better, that Israel today is more isolated than it has ever been. How many, how many of you have seen that kind of analysis? Israel is isolated. Well, my job as Director General of the Foreign Ministry of Israel is to look into that question. And as I examine that, what I find is we're facing an unprecedented growth in our foreign contacts worldwide. And an enormous desire on the part of many countries to establish closer relations with Israel. True, we've had a big problem in Europe. And much of that problem has surfaced in relationship to the decisions of the European Union in Brussels. Our relations with individual European states have been excellent. But with the EU as a body, they've posed things, created problems that we've had, we've had to fight and we've had to disagree with. When all of a sudden it was proposed that products manufactured in Judea and Samaria in East Jerusalem, in the Golan Heights, places that were not under Israeli control prior to the 67 war, that those items must be labeled differently than products manufactured in Israel. The Europeans thought we were angry because we were going to take some kind of financial loss. It had nothing to do with money. It had to do with principle. Because one of the first things I asked the people in the foreign ministry to check is that if you have a territorial conflict, if there's a territorial conflict elsewhere in the world and goods are manufactured in a disputed territory, do they have to be labeled differently? So for example, I have a visit of the Director General of the Foreign Ministry of India, and I asked him if a product is manufactured in Kashmir, where frankly, certain countries don't recognize Indian sovereignty. They'd rather not talk about it, but that's the official position. Do you have to label the product differently than you label a product manufactured in India? And say, no way. Some of us were just in Cyprus. And I asked the Cypriot foreign ministry, I said, listen, if I build, if I put up a bicycle factory in northern Cyprus, which has been under Turkish military occupation since 1974, if I put up a factory there, and I want to export my bicycles to the European Union. How do I do that? So said, well, you, you bring the, prop, the bicycles to Cyprus proper, and from Cyprus proper, they go into the EU territories. And I go, do you have to put, what, what do you put on the bicycle? Do you write, made in occupied northern Cyprus? Do you put it in made in northern Cyprus? No. You put it in made in Cyprus. And so what you find is that this demand to say manufactured in the occupied West Bank and not made in Israel, that demand does not apply anyplace else. And so the problem with that whole policy of labeling is that it's discriminatory. It discriminates between Israel and other countries. And that's what's unacceptable. And that's what we told the EU. I went into that in a little bit of detail because I want you to understand that all these efforts, in one way or another, they're not there because of um, idealism. They're there because someone wants to challenge Israel's fundamental rights. And that's something which we reject, and Prime Minister Netanyahu was very firm about in his meetings with Mrs. Mogherini, the uh, foreign basically the foreign uh, minister of the EU. But in any case, we're not rejecting Europe. 
We're seeking to improve our ties with Europe, and they are improving. And we reached a modus vivendi with the European Union on this labeling issue. Some people in Israel said, you know what? Our relations in Asia are improving so much. Maybe we should just sit to the hell with Europe and focus on, on our new Asian connections. And that is part of this blooming of our foreign relations, which I wanted to share with you. Our relations are tightening with Japan, with China, with Vietnam, with India. And these are becoming increasingly important trade partners. You know, there are so many Israelis that are now flying to Beijing that a whole new airline just came into existence with two flights a week, Tel Aviv, Beijing. I've been on the older flights of El Al. They're packed, you can't get a seat. And that isn't because people want to go to the uh, you know, various tourist sites in China. They're there because a lot of people are doing business in that country. Oh, by the way, that's another BRICS country because you are a part of the BRICS system. So, and the same is true for India. So relations are booming in Asia. We're taking care of things in Europe. We've made some new inroads in Latin America. I won't go into all the details. But that's a large part of the world. Now, while the Prime Minister has been directing us in the Foreign Ministry to seize the moment, to try and expand our diplomatic contacts worldwide, we made a decision recently that we are coming back to Africa. And he said, we're coming back to Africa, and Africa is coming back to us. And so he is planning a tour of at least four African countries in July, which will be part of that process of re-engaging with Africa. We had heard that there were certain difficulties in the relationship of South Africa with Israel. These go back many years. We have narratives that don't click, which is sometimes as important as trade relations. And therefore, in the last year, I sat with my staff in the uh, foreign ministry, and I said, we've got to come back to South Africa. We've got to build up our ties with South Africa. And because we have a capable ambassador, such a capable ambassador, I knew this was a doable proposition. So we just did have meetings this morning in, with your foreign ministry. And I have to say, they weren't tense. They weren't full of rancor. They were full of curiosity and desire to do more. Can I guarantee, you know, a Prague Spring? Can I guarantee some enormous breakthrough? It's going to take a lot of work. But I feel the potential. And you know something? If you take the hardest nut to crack, if you take a country which is not worked closely with Israel and you create a rapport and you create mutual understanding and most importantly you create mutual respect, you can then achieve what you want to achieve in that relationship. And an improved relationship between Israel and South Africa will radiate across the entire African It'll affect decision makers, not just in the southern parts of the African continent, but across the whole area. And this is why we're going to invest our time and effort in improving these relationships. Finally, I have to tell you that one of the, I would call it side benefits, but it's not just a side benefit, it's a main benefit, of the very difficult situation in the Middle East today is that we find ourselves with new relationships with our Arab neighbors. Maybe because we're all threatened by Iran. We're all concerned with the rise of ISIS or Daesh. And therefore our cooperation has reached levels that I wish I could tell you about, but we have to keep them quiet. One of the things we did this last year is we opened up an office 
uh, in Abu Dhabi, which uh, services an international organization called IRENA. IRENA is a renewable energy organization. Now that office is not a consulate. It is not an Israeli uh, embassy in Abu Dhabi. It's an international organization which happens to be in Abu Dhabi. But this would have been impossible 10 years ago. I told the story in the foreign ministry today that I was in another Arab state. And you know, when you go to these bilateral meetings, your staff prepares for you talking points. You know, one, two, three, what are the points you're supposed to raise in the dialogue with them? So we had a very friendly opening of our meeting and my counterpart said, Dory, you start with your talking points, then I'll read mine. So I started going, one, two, three, four, sort of like a robot. And, uh, and I get halfway through the document, and he looks at me, and I'm wondering if I said something wrong. You know that feeling where you're not sure whether you said something offensive, and I look at the talking points, and I didn't see anything particularly irritating there. It didn't take into account their sensitivities. So I said, is there a problem? He said, well, I wouldn't call it a problem. But your talking points are identical to my talking points. <laughs> now that wasn't because we got a copy of them and then we copied them over and used them. That's because our interests are so closely aligned today that when our foreign ministries prepare what are the fundamental interests going into a meeting, they're the same. So I started using a little phrase in, in these uh, kinds of discussions, I'd say, you speak Arabic, we speak Hebrew, when it comes to the Middle East today, we're speaking the same language. And that's what we're discovering. So here we have a blossoming of our ties with the Arab world. We have a, an ability to fix our ties with Europe, new ties in Asia, and hopefully, an expansion of our ties in Africa. This is not an isolated Israel. This is not a delegitimized Israel that nobody wants to have anything to do with. This is a strong and self-confident Israel. And I'll just share with you the two things I think we bring to the table. Because it's always real politique at the end of the day. Number one, countries facing all kinds of economic challenges, particularly related to agriculture, related to water. All those countries want to knock on Israel's door. You know, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu was in Davos when I was in the audience. And he was giving a lecture. And he, yeah, he was being questioned by a CNN reporter. And CNN, and in response to Israel's cooperation with countries, he said, who do you think produces more milk, a cow from the Netherlands, a cow from France, or a Jewish cow from Israel. <laughs> so it turns out we have special departments in our universities who specialize in this area. And it is true, the cows that we now have are producing more milk than anyone, which means countries that have problems manufacturing enough dairy products for their population are not interested in talking to Israel. We have a farm with Jewish cows in China. <laughs> we have a very intense dialogue with Russia today, which wants to be more independent in the production of food. They're taking the interest in those cows as well, and a lot of other things. Yes, and Russia's part of BRICS, right? That's your international partners. So my point is that, number one, this agricultural element pulls them into a closer tie with Israel. And there's something else, too. Luckily, this threat has not come down to the southern part of Africa. But if you go to Central Africa, East Africa, and West Africa, you have radical jihadi organizations, just like Daesh, Al-Shabaab in Somalia. 
and in West Africa as well. And countries facing these problems want to understand the phenomenon of what they're dealing with. Explain to us where this jihadi Islam comes from and how do we contend with it? And who's funding them? And who's providing the ideological perspective? Who's training the imams speaking in the mosques on Friday? They turn to Israel. They want to cooperate with Israel. And Israel can in many ways improve their security. So whether it is this security dimension that I just began to touch on, or whether it is the agricultural water problems, countries with droughts, all of this is causing a renaissance of our relations with Africa. And it's my hope that South Africa will be part of that renaissance. So if I may summarize what I'm trying to tell you, we've spent the last few decades with all kinds of movements in the world trying to tear down the ideological structure of the Jewish state. They try to say that Zionism is racism, Zionism is colonialism, Zionism is imperialism. I have one word to tell them, or one expression to tell them, and I say it over and over again. Zionism is the national liberation movement of the Jewish people. And that is what they have to internalize. And there's nothing like success to help you convince people. And Israel is a very successful country. It's a motivated country. Yeah, we have our problems. And self-criticism, which is part of democracy, sometimes strikes people as, how can I put this, uh, self-defeating. But we have, our, we have our difficult newspaper articles. We have our op-ed pieces that attack sometimes ourselves, aspects of the state of Israel. But the people know. They know they have a strong country. They know they have a confident country. They know there are waves of security threats hurled against us, and at the end of the day, we figure out how to defeat them, and we do. And therefore, our Foreign Ministry of Israel represents a success story. And um, it's a success story that requires also a close relationship with the diaspora. So in my coming to South Africa, to talk to the South African government, it is clearly an important aspect for us that the Jewish community benefit from an improved tie between South African institutions and the State of Israel. And we'll be seeking that. So thank you for your perseverance, your strength through a lot of these hard delegitimization efforts. You know, the whole BDS movement was born in Durban, South Africa in 2001. The uh, attacks against us for war crimes came from certain individuals here as well. But we'll stand strong, we'll defend ourselves with confidence, and we appreciate the strong backing of this Jewish community, which will help us build a good relationship with this country. We're determined to try. It's not easy. We're just at the, maybe we've just made the first baby steps today, but we're gonna persist. And I wanna thank you for being there this entire time. Good night. The South African Jewish community has been fighting long and hard to defend our beloved Israel. 
literally from before its official inception in 1948, dating back to the early 1900s, 